All right. So today I'll talk about uh, some work in progress that I've been doing with uh, Andy Connolly over at the Dirac Institute at the University of Washington on doing dimensionality reduction of the SDSS spectra using autoencoders. And just to motivate um, dimensionality reduction and my, why you might think about autoencoders, I thought I would start with a simpler, more familiar uh, method of dimensionality reduction, namely principal component analysis. And so on the left, uh, I've got a scatter plot of two variables that happen to be correlated. And if you do principal component analysis on these two variables, you get uh, a new basis to think about this two-dimensional space. And the basis is defined so that the first component that you get, this long arrow going to the right, explains the most possible variance that you can with a single component. And then you, uh, you fix that first component, you ask for the second component that can explain the most possible variance until you span the space. And PCA can be quite useful if you think about uh, projecting your data onto only the first couple of components. So I could, because these two variables are highly correlated, I can imagine projecting onto just the first PCA component. And that will preserve a lot of the variance structure that's in my data, but I've also reduced its dimensionality from two down to one. And uh, if you think of PCA as a compression method where I've taken a two-dimensional thing and compressed it down to one, I can imagine reconstructing the original two-dimensional data by just multiplying by the PCA vectors. And of course, you know, I've lost some of the information, but this projection is the one that gives you the least mean squared error between your original data and the reconstructed data in this multi-dimensional space. So reducing dimensionality from 2D down to 1D isn't that useful, but PCA really shines when you go to larger dimensions dimensionality. So PCA has been widely uh, applied all over astronomy, and there's been uh, previous work doing the, uh, finding the PCA basis of the Sloan galaxies. And, okay, good, I have a pointer. So when you do a PCA analysis, you get the mean uh, spectrum that your data set has, and maybe you want to interpret this as a gap mostly quiescent galaxy with some star formation going on. And then you get your uh, PCA basis vectors. And because everything is linear, it's uh, easy to interpret what a change in the PCA components uh, means. So if your first component has a higher number, that means you're adding, or yeah, if it's higher, you're adding some multiple of this spectrum. And so it's negative at the blue end, and it's got um, negative components for these emission lines. So you might want to try to interpret this as a decrease in star formation rate, because you're uh, taking away blue light, and you're taking away these nebular emission lines. And so you can try to do this interpretation for the higher components, uh, but it typically does get harder to find uh, good interpretations as you get to the higher components. But it turns out you actually don't need a lot of PCA components to do uh, some interesting things with the basis. You can form combinations of just the first three PCA components and make this uh, diagram that cleanly separates uh, galaxies by type, going from early type galaxies near the top to later types near the middle to extreme emitters at the bottom. And so you've taken this uh, set of spectra, each of which have thousands of components. And uh, with a summary that only involves three numbers, you can already do some rudimentary classification. PCA can also be uh, useful to denoise your data, because the PCA components are being determined using the entire data set that you feed in. So then if you take some uh, of your original noisy data, and project it onto the first 10 PCA components, you get reconstructed spectra that look uh, very physically pl plausible, 
and a lot of the noise that's uh, present in your original spectra have just been projected out. So PCA has a lot of nice uh, properties that we'd like to keep. The, one of the main disadvantages of PCA is that it's a completely uh, linear method. And what that means is that if you've got nonlinear features like uh, spectral lines that can have uh, varying broadnesses, that can be hard to capture in a small number of PCA components. So on the left here, I've got a uh, spectrum with broad spectral lines in the gray. And the thin black line is showing a PCA reconstruction using the first 10 components. And while maybe the overall shape of the spectrum is being captured, you can see there's very clear differences between the original and the reconstruction. And you have to add more PCA terms in order to get an acceptable reconstruction. And so, you know, if we really want to use this for dimensionality reduction, the fewer dimensions we have to think about, the better. And so this uh, motivates uh, thinking about autoencoders, which we've already heard uh, about uh, earlier in this meeting. And in the basic structure of an autoencoder, it's a feed-forward neural network where you input your data examples, and you have your neural network uh, get smaller until you come to one layer that you call your code or your latent space. And then you have uh, your neural network fan back out until you have your output layer uh, be the same size as your input layer. And then you train this neural network uh, with some sort of reconstruction loss to incentivize the network to make the reconstruction as close to the data as possible. And the fact that the network gets smaller in the middle prevents the network from just learning the identity function. So instead, because it's constrained in the middle, it has to learn some sort of compression for the data. It has to figure out how to explain this big spectrum with a small number of numbers. And it's not going to come up with some generic all-purpose compression, but it's going to find a compression that's really tailored to the training set that you've given it. And so you can think of this as a nonlinear generalization of PCA in that you, know, you feed in some large dimensional thing and you can get a smaller dimensional representation of it that then you can reconstruct. Um, you, know, you can take any point in this latent space and get a reconstructed spectrum out. And it turns out that actually if you gave all of your neurons linear activation functions, that's functionally equivalent to PCA. In particular, uh, variational autoencoders um, have a lot of nice properties. And they even have a Bayesian in interpretation where you can think of the, the decoder as a generative model that has some latent parameters. And so if you think of the reconstruction loss as a likelihood, if you imagine putting a prior, some sort of prior on the latent space, combining that prior with your likelihood implies some sort of posterior distribution. And so you can imagine making an encoder that doesn't just give you a single point in the latent space, but instead uh, gives you a distribution. So you can put something simple in like uh, a normal distribution characterized by means and variances. And so if you train your encoder to uh, match the posterior as closely as it can, really you're doing variational inference where your decoder is a generative model and your encoder is doing inference. So I'll show you uh, some of the results that we get in applying variational autoencoders to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey spectra. Uh, to pre-process the data, I uh, move all the spectra to their rest frame wavelengths and give them a common uh, wavelength binning. Uh, so I bin them down to 1,000 spectral elements. Um, right now I'm using two layers each in the encoder and decoder. And I'm uh, encoding them down to a latent space of 10 parameters. And I chose that number because that's where uh, the performance of PCA starts to peter out. And so uh, one thing you can do is you can reconstruct spectra 
using this autoencoder and compare those to the spectra that you get using a 10 component PCA. And for the most part, you get moderate improvements in the mean squared error of your reconstructions. But one number that you'll notice in particular is that for these broadline quasars that have uh, you know, spectral lines that vary uh, widely in their broadness, you get a much more substantial improvement. And here I've got a zoom in of a broadline quasar in the black dashed lines. The orange line here is a autoencoder reconstruction using only five components compared to the five component PCA reconstruction. And so while both are trying to explain you know, this emission line, the autoencoder is better able to reproduce the shape uh, even with only five parameters. We can also uh, look at different ways uh, of looking at this latent space. Uh, we can use standard uh, line ratio tests that are used to classify uh, galaxies. And if we look at the first and third component of the autoencoder latent space, it seems that these classes separate quite well, even with just three components. And there seems to be, this first component seems to be a, uh, going from quiescent and absorption galaxies to emission galaxies in the x direction. And then the narrow line quasars and broad line quasars are separated out by the third PCA component. Because an autoencoder is a generative model, you can also uh, draw paths in this latent space and ask for reconstructions along this path to try to understand uh, how the autoencoder is using the latent space to encode information. And so one interesting thing to do is to take the centroid of the narrow line galaxies and then travel to the centroid of the broad line galaxies and ask for spectra along the way. And so as you expect, you see that the H alpha line starts broadening, but also these line ratios um, seem to be changing. And uh, another traversal we can do is to instead go from the centroid of the emission line galaxies to the centroid of the narrow line quasars. And so we get these reconstructed spectra. But we can also do uh, more classical line ratio tests on these synthetic spectra. And so here is uh, oxygen 3 and nitrogen 2. And the kind of boundary that's agreed upon for the boundary between uh, emission line galaxies and quasars. And you can see that as we travel in the autoencoder latent space, uh, we also travel uh, in this line ratio space and cross the boundary between these two classes. Uh, so to wrap up, I'll put my conclusion slide up and just say that autoencoders are a unsupervised method that you can learn that you can use to learn compressions or representations of your data sets. And one way to think of them is as a nonlinear generalization of PCA. And you can get a uh, better reconstruction than with PCA with the same number of components, which isn't a surprise because it's a nonlinear method. Uh, and um, you get the most gains if you have nonlinear features that you're trying to fit. The latent space of the autoencoder seems to separate out uh, existing classes that um, we've identified. And with uh, PCA, um, you have an interpretation of what the PCA components mean. You're just adding together linear combinations of templates. With autoencoders, it's a bit harder. You have to um, you know, explore the latent space and see how the spectra change as you move around in the latent space to understand what the autoencoder is doing. Uh, so with that, I'll take any questions.